So the optimal choice, so that x1 and x2 star of good goods 1 and 2, I mean, up to n if we have n different types of goods, at some set of prices, and income is called the demanded bundle. Is the demanded bundle. Now, when prices or income change, that demanded bundle can change. When prices or income change, this optimal choice, this x1 and x2 star, likely to change. So the demanded bundle is going to change. I don't know if I need commas there. If, when prices or income change, um, in general, it's not always the case, but in general, the optimal choice will, will change. It will also change. So our uh, demanded or our demand functions for these two goods, x the demand for good uh, one is going to be a function of the price of good one, the price of good two, and income. And the same thing for the amount of, of good two. It's a function of the price of good one, the price of good two, and income. And different references will result um, in different demand functions. So we're going to explore some different preferences that we saw in previous chapters and think about what their demand functions look like. So perfect substitutes and perfect complements. Um, and then we'll kind of move on and, and kind of talk, you know, we're going to apply some calculus to this and kind of talk about implications for taxes and things like that. Substitutes. And we're going to assume that there's this one for one exchange, like with the black and blue pens. We're not, you know, we're not going to have two black pens for one blue pen, et cetera, et cetera. So let's assume it's a one for one exchange. So we can have three possible cases. The first is that the price of good two is greater than the price of good one. We're willing to exchange them one for one. But the price of good two is greater than the price of good one. Well, we're going to spend our whole budget on good one because it's cheaper and we're we like it just as much as good too. And kind of visually what's happening here is the slope of the, of the budget constraint is flatter than the slope of the indifference curves. Remember, it's a one for one, the slope of the budget constraint is um, so the slope of the indifference curve is negative one. And here, if, if P2 is greater than P1, then, then the slope, remember, which is negative P1 over P2 is, is less than one. So you have like a flatter slope, um, which means that we're gonna get a corner solution and we're only gonna have, uh, we're only gonna buy uh, product or commodity one. The second case would be if the prices were equal. Well, this is a bit, you know, I don't know if it's more complicated or not, but we could have like a continuum of different uh, optimal bundles for this consumer, because if the prices are the same, the value the same, then, then as long as they're spending their whole budget, 
that's good enough. They're going to be maximizing their utility and they're in the highest indifference group possible. So any combination um, that satisfies the budget constraint, oops, budget constraint, sorry, is optimal. So there's no kind of unique solution in that in that um, in that situation. And finally, we could have the opposite of, of here, this first case where um, P2 is actually less than P1. Well, now we're just going to be spending all of our money on good two because, again, we're willing to exchange them one for one, and, and now commodity two is just cheaper than commodity one. So we're just going to buy all commodity one because we like it just as much. Um, so only purchase good two. And so if we want to kind of write out what this means, maybe mathematically, that our demand for x, or I'll put x1 here, um, is m over p1. If uh, p1 is less than p2, we're going to spend, you know, spend all of our money. Remember, m is our budget. p1 is the price of good one. This is how much x1 we can afford if we spend our entire budget. So if P1 is less than P2, we're going to spend our entire budget on good one. This middle case here could be any uh, combination between 0 and M over P1. And finally, um, 0 in the last case. Hopefully this is fitting on the screen, but I guess I'll have to check afterwards. So this is it. Um, that's true. This is if P1 equals P2. The second one, hopefully that fits on the screen. And this last one is if uh, P1 is greater than P2. So this is like what our demand function looks like for these perfect substitutes. If you wanted to draw it out, we can draw like, the first case out maybe. Here's x2 and here's x1. Let's say these are our indifference curves here, they have a slope of negative one. If we're willing to exchange one for one. And in this first case where P1 is less than, than P2, what's happening is that our budget line is flatter. And so we're at this point here, where X1 star equals you know, M over P1, and X2 star equals zero. That's the kind of this first situation here. The second situation is that basically these lines are, are kind of on top of each other, that the budget constraint and, and the indifference curve are basically the, the same line. And the third case is if, you know, instead of having this budget line being flatter than these indifference curves, it's steeper. And so we kind of connect on this, uh, on this axis, on this y-axis, the intercept is, is we're going to have only good x2. Okay, so that's how the demand functions work for perfect substitutes. Now let's move on to uh, perfect complements and then neutrals and bads and, and so on and so forth. And again, we're going to look at the simplest case possible. We want the equal amount of both goods. So remember with left and right shoes, for example, we want equal amounts of each of the shoes. We're going to make that assumption we come up with our, with our demand function here. Now, if, if it was a different, you know, with our tea and, and coffee example, we want uh, two teaspoons or two whatever tablespoons of, of sugar um, in your tea per cup of tea, that'd be slightly different. But, but hopefully you can think of um, how to generalize the simplest cases, right? So we're going to look at the simplest case. It's going to be, I think, pretty straightforward to kind of generalize in your head want, um, sorry, equal amounts of both goods. Oops, no either. Sorry, my, my writing's bad this week. Um, and so if that's true, we have our budget line P1 X1 plus P2 X2 equals M. But we know X1, yeah, sorry, 
equals x2 here, right? We have the same numbers, and so we can just call that x. And so essentially, like, by 1 of x is costing us p1 plus p2, right? So if this is true, then we can kind of rewrite our budget constraint. That's p1x plus p2x equals m. which means x equals m over p1 plus p2. Just, you know, we can common factor the x out and divide both sides by p1 plus p2. So essentially, what we're thinking of here, uh, essentially, a single good with a price of P1 plus P2. And how to think about this case, and hopefully it will be large enough down here, amount of good one, amount of good two, we have these indifference curves that were these, these right angles, where that kind of kink is at one, one, two, two, three, three, or, or whatever, the equal number on the x and y axis, like the, these kinks are along the x equals y, uh, kind of locus that's coming out of, of the origin here. And so essentially then we have this is the amount of x1 and this is the amount of x2. So that's how perfect complements um, work. 